Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, some of you might be wondering why is Chris announcing a webinar on text mining and inviting a text miner? Uh, because I tend to be rather skeptical about text mining and somebody once summarized my point of view like, okay, the best way to mine text probably is just to read papers. Um, and that, that's kind of correct. Um, but I also looked at what's happening in the field and uh, comments and things like, why don't you really share the approaches that are being used in text mining? Why don't you make them more modular so people could reuse part of your approach? And mostly, why don't you really share your results so other people could really build on these? And then um, people pointed me to Lars Jules, um, who typically does all these things. So that was a reason to look at it, especially since his results tend to end up in major resources, like even in PubMed Central, well, the Europe version. And uh, my original question was, could you not just teach people how to then reuse this? And he said, wait a sec, Chris, can I first explain what I really do and why, how and why that is important? Um, so that was a reason to invite Lars here. And um, I think the the, then you can all decide yourself whether we should ask him again to show us more of the technical aspects <laughs> of how to do what he is int he's introducing now. Uh, with that, I'm happy to give the word to Lars Jules, but not before saying that he is also a really nice guy to work with. Thank you, Chris. Thanks for the invitation and thanks for introducing me. So indeed, I'll be talking about text mining of disease gene networks today. And uh, I'll start by saying that one should definitely be skeptical when it comes to text mining and reading is something that should, should definitely be done. So first of all, before I get into the technical parts of this, let me give a quick introduction to who I am. And I am Lars Juel Jensen. I'm also Lars Juel Jensen on Twitter. I'm pretty active online, so you're welcome to follow me there. And you're, of course, also welcome to retweet anything you see in this presentation if you feel like it. What I do for a living, I work as a group leader at the University of Copenhagen, more specifically at the Novo Nordisk Foundation Center for Protein Research, which is a basic research center embedded within the medical faculty at the university. Don't get confused by the name, even though it says Novo Nordisk, it does not mean that I work for Novo Nordisk. We just have funding from the Novo Nordisk Foundation. I should also mention, in the interest of conflict of interest and just background on me, I am a co-founder of a company called Intomics, which, does, which is a CRO mainly doing the same kinds of omics data analysis and interpretation that I also do in my group here at University of Copenhagen. I don't work in the company though, but I'm one of the founders and I'm thus one of the owners. What I work on in the, at the university and also what the company works on is a lot of molecular data, especially a lot of data coming from modern omics studies. Another thing I work on at the university is medical data. So we're trying to do a lot to bring together what we know at the molecular level about biology with what we know from the healthcare system about medicine, diseases, and treatment thereof. And what do these two things have in common? Well, what they have in common is really that the vast majority of the information we have on molecular biology and on, on medical data and patient histories comes in the form of unstructured data. And that is inconvenient because if there's something computers is good at, it is to analyze structured data. And when it comes to things like unstructured data, text, we are in a bit more deep water. So that's really why I got interested in text mining. I should say, I actually, I'm not particularly interested in text mining. Lots of people ask me, uh, wouldn't you be worried if we managed to put everything into a structured database so that we don't need to do text mining? And the answer is no, I wouldn't be worried. I would be happy. So now I wouldn't have to do text mining. It's a tool for me. It is not something I do because I find it interesting in its own right. The reason why we need to do text mining is if we are looking at the biomedical literature, it looks something like this. This is a back of the envelope estimate. If we naively imagine that everything is indexed in PubMed, which it isn't, and if we assume that the average article is five pages long, it's longer, then printing it out on standard 80 gram A4 paper would give you a pile well over 10 kilometers. It will for sure be more than 20 kilometers as well, 
but who's counting at this stage? The reality is whether it's 10 kilometers or 20 kilometers, as much as we would like to, we simply cannot read it. There's too much. Even if we didn't have to read this backlog, just keeping up with the new literature coming out is problematic since you have a new paper coming out approximately every 40 seconds. So whether we like it or not, and whether Chris likes it or not, we need to get a computer to read this. And whenever I need to get a computer to do something that is even halfway smart, I consider it useful to think of a computer as being about as smart as a door. And by that, I mean that if I put sufficient effort into it, I can teach it to do specific tricks. And borrowing a cartoon from Gary Larson, what we say to dogs, okay, Ginger, I've had it. You stay out of the garbage, understand, Ginger, stay out of the garbage or else. And what the dog hears, is blah, blah, ginger, blah, 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 ginger, blah, 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 blah. So it understood its own name. And it's important to realize this is pretty much my level of ambition when I'm doing text mining. I do not suffer from the illusion that the computer is somehow going to magically understand the deeper meaning of the text we are writing. It's going to recognize, well, not its own name, but names of stuff in the text. And this is the task that people in text mining love to refer to as named entity recognition or abbreviate NER for short. And it may sound impressive at first until you realize that this literally means recognizing stuff with names. And unsurprisingly, if you want to recognize names in text, a good starting point is to have a dictionary of the names you want to recognize. Not only do you need to know the names, you need to know which ones are synonyms for the same concepts. So you need to be able to have a dictionary where you have synonyms for things and you have them all mapped down to some sort of database identifiers or concepts and ontologies. So to get more concrete, we need to know that there is a protein called cycle independent kinase one. We need to know that CDC two is the same thing. We need to handle what again is fancily called autographic variation, which is the long way of saying that things may be written in slightly different ways. And by that, I mean that in the dictionary, we may know that there is a protein called cycle-independent kinase 1, but boy, wouldn't it be nice if we still recognize it in the text when the authors write it with a hyphen. Also, we know that CDC2 is the same thing, but CDC2 is a human gene. It's also a gene in mouse. It's also a gene in rat. It's also a gene in yeast. And to avoid the confusion, people will tend to, when they talk about multiple species in one paper, prefix the name with an H to say human CDC2. If you go look up in Uniprot, I'm pretty sure you won't find this name. So you need to teach the computer little tricks like this, that you can put an H in front of any human gene symbol and it still means the same. You can put an M in front of any mouse gene symbol and it still means the same, etc. This is not rocket science or anything approaching it. This is really, really basic. It's just things that you need to get right in order to not get bad results. Now, after doing all of this, you're going to do a good, num a good job of finding a lot of names in the text, but you're going to have the problem that you find a lot of false positives. And this is where the last com component comes in, the blacklist. So the idea in a blacklist is that you have a name, a list of names that are a really bad idea from the standpoint of doing text mining. They're not necessarily wrong names. These may be perfectly valid names, but from a text mining perspective, they're a bad idea because when they appear in the text, they typically mean something else. My favorite example of that is that the Human Gene Naming Committee, HGNC, in their infinite wisdom decided that it would be a good idea to use this name as the recommended gene symbol for gene. Anyone who's ever been in a wet lab will know that SDS is a detergent that you use for lots of different things, including for denaturing proteins. So most of the time when SDS is mentioned in a paper, they're talking about SDS the detergent, not SDS the gene. And if you were to tag SDS as a gene every time you see the acronym SDS, you would be in deep trouble. Especially because the next thing we typically want to do in relation extraction after named entity recognition is to do relation extraction. And the way you do relation extraction a very simple approach that works remarkably well and which is surprisingly difficult to beat is simple co-mentioning approaches. So you simply assume that if things are mentioned together in the literature, they are likely related somehow. Could be two proteins being mentioned together because they work together. It could be a gene being mentioned together with a disease because it is involved in that disease. 
Now, you could, of course, reasonably argue that just because two things are mentioned in a paper, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're actually doing anything together. However, that's where we start doing really fancy statistics, also known as counting. The logic being that if things keep being mentioned together, it's probably not for the fun of it. It's probably because there actually is some sort of association between them. The question is, of course, how you want to count. Should you count just how many documents mention them together? Should you only count it if they are mentioned together in the same paragraph? Or should you be even more stringent and only count them if they're mentioned together in the same sentence? And asking which of the three you should do is a bit of a trick question because none of them is the right answer. Of course, being mentioned together in the same sentence is stronger evidence than being mentioned together in the same paragraph only. And being mentioned together in the same paragraph is stronger evidence than being mentioned together in different paragraphs in the same paper. But you shouldn't pick one over the other. Instead, what you want to do is to combine all of them into a combined co-occurrence score that quantifies how much are these two entities mentioned together in the literature, taking into account the distance as well. Now, if you do this, you can get quite good results. And it's always tricky how to quantify results in text mining. And when you, use, when you run formal benchmarks, it can be very hard to agree because often the tasks that people have assigned don't re are not exactly the same, and then you end up benchmarking who's actually solving the task most similar to the benchmark and not who's doing the best job at what their tool was intended to do. But looking at the data, creating benchmark sets and so on, the performance estimates that, estimates that we get is that if you do a solid job on blacklisting the names that are a bad idea, we can typically get somewhere in the order to 80 to 90 percent precision. By that I mean when we find something mentioned in the text, 80 to 90 percent of the time it actually means what we think it means. On the recall side, which is finding what you're looking for, we get about 70 to 80 percent recall. That means going through the text, we in 70 to 80 percent of the cases we manage to find the things that I actually mentioned. So this is pretty good. Um, however, the main advantage of my tool, it's definitely up there among the best in terms of precision and recall, but I wouldn't say it's better than what else is out there. But where it really does stand out is speed. And speed matters when you want to do text mining. So pipeline that we have available, a C++ tool that is open source and available, is able to process something in the order of 100 full text articles per second per CPU call and it scales perfectly with more CPU cores. So we are able to quite easily process massive corpora. Not only dealing with PubMed-sized corpora or dealing with tagging the open access part of PubMed Central. We published a study in which we looked at 15 million full text articles that we ran through it, and that was simply no problem to do. There were all kinds of problems in getting access to the articles and pre-processing the text because it came out of PDF files, but in terms of being able to deal with that amount of text once you had it, that was no problem at all. <clears throat> and adding more text really matters, because if we go and benchmark the performance of our relation extraction, how good a job are we doing at, for example, extracting gene disease associations based on co-mentioning, we can see if we're looking at the most important curves to compare is the MetLine result versus the core abstracts. Um, uh, no, core abstracts versus full text, sorry. So that is looking at full text articles for 15 million articles versus looking at the same 15 million abstracts only. So that tells you the difference between having just abstracts and having full text. And you see that we are getting a dramatic improvement. Pretty much at any given false positive rate that you're willing to accept, we are able to get about 1.5 times as many true positives out. So we get a lot more by simply putting more text into the same pipeline. And I find this quite remarkable because you're looking at a pipeline that was fine-tuned to work well on abstracts. And just taking that one as is and throwing full text articles at it, you get notably better results. So that really highlights the importance of having access. Of course, the reality is that when we want to build databases that we are free to distribute and where we're not tied down by, li by licenses from the publishers completely unnecessarily, then 
we are limited to work with abstracts plus the open access literature, which we get from PubMed Central. So that's what we are processing on a regular basis. And by regular basis, I mean that we are updating the text mining results every weekend. And that's possible only because of the software being so fast. What we do with those results is to build a lot of community databases. These cover a lot of different types of relationships. It can be disease genes, so linking genes to the diseases they're involved in. We have the website called Diseases. And in that one, you can get associations, a lot of them coming from text mining. We have tissue localization, so mapping proteins or, or um, transcripts down to where in the body they're expressed, whether it is in human or in a, in a model organism. We have subcellular localization, where we're similarly mapping things down to parts of the cell, like mitochondria, nucleus, etc. And we're doing, of course, protein interactions, which are available through the string database. So it is the same text mining pipeline that produces the text mining results in the string database. And I should mention in this context in particular that the string database is an Elixir core data resource. It is used by about 30,000 people a week. So it is a, a massively used resource. Now, what all of these resources have in common, aside from the text mining, is that they are integrative resources. So they all run the same text mining pipeline, but they also all include additional evidence from other sources. And I think this is one of the things that really sets these apart from what many other text mining groups are doing. Because there are lots of groups who do text mining and do a good job at doing text mining, but they then produce a resource that only has text mining results. And if you're trying to target actual users, biologists who want to look up information, they frankly don't care whether the information comes from text mining. If you could get it from curated knowledge from resources like Genetics Home Reference, from Uniprot, from React Home, then you would love to have that. And we are pulling all of those in and putting them into the databases and many more. Also, you want to mine experimental data that are available. If you want to look at disease gene associations, you probably want to mine the genome-wide association studies available from the GWAS catalog. If you're interested in tissue expression, you want to look at things like the human protein atlas. And if you're building something like the string database, you obviously wouldn't want string to only contain text mining results. You would want to integrate manually curated data from experimental screens landing in the NDAC database. So we're doing all of this taking all of these different resources, putting them together with text mining, and that way building a protein knowledge graph, if you will. And there are some key features here of this knowledge graph that really makes it powerful. One is that we map everything to a common identifier space. So the set of protein identifiers that we use in the diseases database and in the tissues resource, the compartments resource, and in string, they're all the same. So there's no dealing with identifier mapping when you're trying to combine these data and make some sort of inferences from the network. Another key feature is that all of them have scoring schemes. When you're putting together data, whether it comes from text mining or it comes from something else, not everything is equally reliable. And there is no one right cutoff. So what you need to do is really to have scoring schemes that allow you to, for each kind of evidence, rank the associations based on which ones are most reliable down to which ones are least reliable. And then importantly, take these different scoring schemes for different kinds of data and calibrate all of them so that you can get some sort of combined confidence scores coming into this. So that way you can have a database where you say, I am this sure that this gene is involved in this disease based on these different lines of evidence which each contribute so and so much to the confidence score. So that's what we're doing in all of these resources. Importantly, so this importantly, this is also made available under open licenses. So you can download all the pre-computed text mining results. You can download all the interactions from any of these resources as simple tab delimited files that are updated on a weekly basis. So a new version goes online every weekend. Um, this is available in many ways. It's available via web interfaces. And one of the key features of the web interfaces is evidence viewers. So that allows you to go into any particular piece of evidence and look at where does it come from. And I would say that is particularly important for text mining because text mined associations can be wrong for a lot of different reasons. 
So can other lines of evidence. But the big advantage to text mind associations is it is very, very easy to find out if something is wrong. Then all you have to do is to click on the evidence viewer, ask it to show me the text. And then since you are a human being, you can read the text and see whether it actually says what the computer thinks it says. So it's very, very easy to find the false positives, which is something that often misleads people to think that the error rate in text mining is higher than it is in other data sources. It actually often is as good or better as other sources. It's just much easier to spot the errors, which is a good thing. And these are available, I already mentioned, as download files. It's available also via RESTful APIs. So you can do all kinds of different queries to get the results from the backend database. And importantly, we make it available via tools with graphical user interfaces, specifically Cytoscape. So what's interesting about Cytoscape is it allows you to do a lot of cool things when it comes to working with networks. So Cytoscape is a network tool. It's designed to do network analysis. It's designed to do network visualization. Where people usually get confused when they get into Cytoscape and contact the help desk is the fact that Cytoscape is not a database. The typical question that comes is, where do I get the network? Because people think that when they start up Cytoscape, somehow magically there is a network. It's not. It's a tool for working with networks. That's why we started working closely with the Cytoscape team, specifically John Scooter Morris at UCSF, to develop the String app. So Cytoscape has this infrastructure that allows you to make community-developed apps that plug in and extend the functionality. And the idea of String app is really, really simple. It allows you to retrieve string networks. So it gives you an easy way, way via the graphical user interface or from the command interface of Cytoscape to fetch data from the string database and the other resources that I talked about and get them into Cytoscape where you can then do analysis without having to script. You can query in a number of different ways. One is starting from a set of genes or proteins. The other is starting from a disease of interest. And the last one that I want to talk about is starting from a topic of interest that is not necessarily a disease. So starting with the first example, a typical kind of analysis that people want to do. You have a proteomics experiment. And a typical outcome of a proteomics experiment is that you have a list of proteins that were identified as changing significantly in this particular study. And usually it's in the order of a few hundred up to maybe about a thousand proteins. You then pull a network for that, and you want to take your data and visualize it onto the network. So you take the network and you color it based on which things are upregulated, which things are downregulated, for example. And then you typically end up getting a figure that looks something like this. And I'm sure you've seen many figures looking something like this if you've read papers, especially if you've looked at papers in the field of proteomics. Um, the bad news is that People who are skeptical of network analysis rightfully look at this figure and say, I can't see anything. It looks like almost everything is connected to everything. It's a hairball, or as we prefer to refer to it, it's a ridiculogram. It's this kind of graphic that doesn't show you anything other than communicating the message, there is a lot. However, there is, there is reason to the madness here. And you can tease it out of the network. So one of the first things we typically want to do with a big network like that is to do network clustering. And then once you've clustered the network and cut it up into some sort of functional modules, you want to do relay out of the network. Then we may also want to go in and query the diseases database, fetch information on which genes are, uh, are related to the disease of interest that we did a proteomic study on, for example, and highlight the known genes in it. And then suddenly the figure from before starts to look like this, which is a lot more manageable. It's still a big network. It still takes time to interpret this, but at least you have an idea about you have some groups of genes that appear to be doing something together. And you could now start going through those and saying, where are my interesting biological stories? And that's what we use this a lot for, is for simply identifying where's the interesting bit of my long gene list. Because going through an Excel sheet will hundreds or thousands of genes is no fun. Another thing that you can use the string app for in Cytoscape is to do a disease comparison. So in this case, you have a set of diseases. You go to the diseases database. 
and you get sets of genes back, so a set of genes for each disease. You then pull in the networks and merge them, so you get a big merge network, lay out the network, cluster it, all those things, and color the genes based on which disease or diseases it's involved in, and you can get to something like this. And now suddenly you get a pretty neat overview. So here I looked at major depressive disorder, Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease, and the, the relatively few genes that are involved in two or all of them. And laying out the network manually based on coloring of things and so on, you can get quite pretty figures very quickly. Um, and it gives a nice overview of what the possible relationships might be between these diseases, what are the differences and what are, what are the commonalities. I'm also heavily involved in developing the FARAS database, or specifically the back end of data. So this is part of the NIH Illuminating the Druggable Genome Project, and they are trying to gather as much data as possible for the druggable families of proteins in the available that you can find in the human genome. And they pull a lot of data from the resources I talked about. So pulling in interactions from string expression data from the tissues resource and disease associations from diseases, as well as simply quantifying how well studied a protein is based on the raw count of how many papers talk about this protein. So what we can use this for, and it comes for free with the string app, is to highlight drug targets. So we immediately pull in information about what are the drug targets, both which ones are potentially druggable and which ones do we already know and we have FDA approved drugs for. And then you can take the same network and suddenly go in and color it and say, okay, where's the action in this? Where do we have the known drug targets? Where do we have the things that might be droppable, but we don't have drugs for it? The last thing I want to talk about is how we can use this to summarize the literature. So, Often you have the problem, I already mentioned it earlier, that the literature is massive. And because the, the literature is so big, it is a big problem to be able to get the overview of the literature in a field where you're not familiar. And we can actually get a network from a PubMed query. And the way it works is like this. So imagine I come with a topic of interest like bacterial drug resistance. I query PubMed for that from within Cytoscape. And what I get back is a set of abstracts that match my query. It could be any query. And now already from the weekly runs of the text mining have named entity recognition done on all of those abstracts. So that means that I can go in and say which genes are mentioned in the abstracts that match my query bacterial drug resistance. And I can then that way get a list of genes that are overrepresented in those abstracts compared to how frequently they appear in PubMed as a whole. And based on that, pull a network of the mentioned genes, color them based on how strongly associated they were in the literature to the query. So how many papers, how much more overrepresented were they in the set of abstracts matching the query compared to the background. And run enrichment analysis on the proteins to then functionally characterize the things in the network visualize selected terms on the network and get something like this. So this illustrates a lot of different functionality that you can do and it really ties together all the databases. To do an analysis like this, like the ones I just presented, you use, this, you use Cytoscape for doing much of it, but you're querying the string database to get associations, you're querying the diseases resource to get disease associations or to get genes for disease of interest. You cluster things using clustering algorithms, you color things based on either your own data or based on the text mining evidence or the disease associations, whatever you want. And we use the enrichment functionality, which is also part of string to pull things in. So that's really what I wanted to cover. I wanted to leave time for questions as well. So I want to acknowledge the people who've done all the work behind this. So on the text mining front, Sunu, Frankil was one of the former postdocs of my group who did a very, very important piece of work on this. Alexander Junge has done work on text mining, also things I haven't talked about today, but a lot of work on integrating the full text mining. Uh, Doha Grisa did a lot of work on it. Um, I forgot to put David Vestergaard on it, who did the 15 million art uh, work. Helen Cook has done work on string and on text mining viruses. Uh, 
Evangelos was doing all the work with me on developing the text mining tool with the tagger in the first place. I'm currently having collaborations with Sampo Pusalo in Turco on developing better ways of how to blacklist things to further improve the quality. And also in the early days at EMBL, I was working with Jasmine Sarich on developing the text mining pipelines. On the protein interaction networks, the string data, of course, the string database is a long running effort. It all started in the group of Pierre Bork, and that group is still involved in doing the string database very much so. But since then, it's spawned out with Christian von Meering, who was in Pierre's group and now runs his own group at the University of Zurich, my own group in Copenhagen. I was also in Pierre's group. And lots of people, way too many to list, have contributed over the years. I want to highlight Damian, who was a PhD student in my group, now working as a, as a scientist in Christian's group, having worked on string all the way. Um, Mikael Kuhn did a lot of work on also integrating small molecule compounds into the string derivative called Stitch, which I didn't talk about today. The Cytoscape string app, that's work done very much by Nadja in my group. Um, Mark has since then also contributed to it, and John Scudamores from UCSF, as I mentioned. This work was funded in part by Swiss Institute of Bioinformatics, who fund um, programmers in Zurich, allowing us to have all the fancy web interfaces and string and so on. Of course, a lot of core funding from EMBL has gone into it over the years. Some of the work was funded by NIH as part of the Illuminating the Drug Genome Project, in particular improvements to the text mining pipeline. And I have core, generous core funding from the Novo Nordisk Foundation too on my group. <laughs> 